Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So we're reading today from the Bhagavad Gita as it is, chapter 17, text 24 through 27. And I guess we'll, um, I'll read the first two texts and then we'll read the last two texts together. Okay. Text 24. Tasmadam iti udaritya yana dana tapaha kriya privartante vira noktaha satatam brahma varinam. Therefore, transcendentalists undertaking performances of sacrifice, charity, and penance in accordance with scriptural regulations begin always with Om to attain the Supreme. Purport by His Divine Grace Srila Prabhupada. Om Tad Vishnu Paramam Padam. Rig Veda 1.22.20. The lotus feet of Vishnu are the supreme devotional platform. The performance of everything on behalf of the Supreme Personality of Godhead assures the perfection of all activity. Text 25. Tariti anabi sandaya, palam yagya tapa kriya, dana kriyascha vividaha, kriyante moksha kangsibi. Without desiring food of results, one should perform various kinds of sacrifice, penance, and charity with the word tat. The pur purpose of such transcendental activities is to get free from material entanglement. Jai. Purport by His Divine Grace, Srila Prabhupada. To be elevated to the spiritual position, one should not act for any material gain. Acts should be performed for the ultimate gain of being transferred to the spiritual kingdom, back home, back to Godhead. Okay, now text 26 through 27, um, we'll read together. Sad bhave, sadu bhave cha, sariti, etad, prayujyate, prashaste, karmani, tataha, sad, chadaha, parta, Use your tail, your gate up a sea, Danicha, Stiti Sad, Itiko Chite, Karma, Chaiva, Tard Artiam, Saditi, Eva be Diate. So we'll read the line by line. Sad bave, sadu bave cha. Saditi etat prayujate. Prashaste karmani tata. Sad chabdaha parta yuyate. Yakye tapasi danicha. Siddhi Sadi Ticho Chate Karma Chaiva Tad Artiyam Sadi Ti Eva Bidiyate Sad Bhave In the sense of the nature of the Supreme Sadu Bhave in the sense of the nature of the devotee. Cha, also. Sat, the word. 
sat, et, thus, etat, this. Prejugete is used. Prejugete in bona fide karmani activities. Tata also sat shadaha the sound sat parta o son of prata yujate is used yagye in sacrifice tapasi in penance dane in charity cha also stiti the situation sat the supreme et thus cha and uchate is pronounced karma work cha also eva certainly tat for that artiyam meant sat the supreme et thus eva certainly abhidiyate is indicated Translation by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta, Sri Swami Prabhupada. The absolute truth is the objective of devotional sacrifice, and it is indicated by the word sat. The performer of such sacrifice is also called sat, as are all works of sacrifice, penance, and charity, which, true to the absolute nature, are performed to please the Supreme Person, O Son of Prata. Translation, please repeat. The absolute truth, the absolute truth. is the objective, the objective of devotional sacrifice. Of devotional sacrifice. And, it and it is indicated by the word sat. The, word sat. the performer of such sacrifice, of such sacrifice is also called sat as are all works of sacrifice, penance, and charity, which true to the absolute nature are performed to please the Supreme Person, O Son of Prata. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. The word prasheste karmani, or prescribed duties, indicate that there are many activities prescribed in the Vedic literature which are purificatory processes beginning from the time of conception up to the end of one's life. Such purificatory processes are adopted for the ultimate liberation of the living entity. In all such activities, it is recommended that one vibrate Om Tat Sat. The words sadbhave and sadubhave indicate the transcendental situation. Acting in Krishna consciousness is called sattva, and one who is fully conscious of the activities of Krishna consciousness is called a sadhu. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 3, Chapter 25, Text 25, it is said that the transcendental subject matter becomes clear in the association of the devotees. The words used are satam prasangat. Without good association, one cannot achieve transcendental knowledge. When initiating a person or offering the sacred thread, one vibrates the words om tat sat. Similarly, in all kinds of performance of yajna, the object is the supreme, om tat sat. The word tad artiyam further means service, means offering service to anything which represents the supreme, including such service as cooking and helping in the Lord's temple, or any other kind of work for broadcasting the glories of the Lord. These supreme words, Om Tat Sat, are thus used in many ways to perfect all activities and make everything complete. Om Anjana Timirandasya, Jananjana Shalakasya, 
Chakshuan militam yena Tasmai sri guve nama Sri Chaitanya manobistam Stapitam yena bhutale Swayam upakadamayam Dadati swapadanti kam Hey Krishna Karuna Sendo Dina Bando Jagapate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishabhani Sute Devi Pranamami Ari Priye Vanchakopa Tarubiascha Kripa Sandubia Evacha Patita Nam Pavanebio Vaishnavabio Namo Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nidyananda Sri Advaita Sri Gadadhar Sri Vasadi Sri Gauda Bhaktarinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare One more time Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So I thank you all very much for your blessings and your presence as we endeavor to invoke the mercy of Srila Prabhupada to understand this transcendental literature. Only by the mercy of the bona fide spiritual master and the sadhus can we understand anything. So I ask for your blessings. To may I be an instrument of Srila Prabhupada's mercy. So in this chapter 17, it's a very interesting chapter. It's called The Divisions of Faith. And the Lord has explained yajna, sacrifice, austerity, charity, uh, I, I'm sorry, uh, tapas, and dana, charity, in terms of the three modes of material nature, sattva, rajas, and tapas. And we understand that everything we do in the world is done in either one of those modes unless we do something transcendentally. So in this particular, as we're coming to the end of the chapter, um, Krishna, Lord Krishna is explaining to Arjuna what is the solution? What is the solution to doing sacrifice and charity and austerity in any of the modes? And how do we rise up to the transcendental mode? Because you know, what we understand about faith is there are many different kinds of faith. There's uh, scriptural faith, which is people act according to what the scriptures say. There's non-scriptural faith, where people just do whatever they please because that's what they want to do. And then there's transcendental faith, which is faith based on following the instructions of the Supreme Lord and his peers' representatives. So this word, Om Tat Sat Sat, this phrase, um, indicates Krishna or God. And if any sacrifices are performed using that phrase, Gradually, it is said that the living being will be elevated to the next level of faith. This is what, what we come to understand. Om Tat Sat is an in, in indirect reference to God. You say, Om. It's the primordial sound. It's the beginning sound of creation. So it refers to God. And anyone who refers to God like that has the mercy of God to gradually move forward. Tat refers to, uh, is another indication of God. And when I was doing a little research, I couldn't find a whole lot about Om Tat Sat, but what I did see is that Prabhupada, when he talked about this phrase, he didn't call it so much as personal as non-personal. And I was trying to get a sense of what that indicates. So we understand that Krishna has three aspects. You know, he's the Bhagavan, He's the Paramatma, he's the Brahman. And sometimes people argue over which aspect is actually God. 
and all of those aspects of God, but the supreme aspect is Bhagavan, the person from whom all these other aspects uh, extend. So when you, the, the Vedas or the scriptures, the purpose is always to get us to come, come up, to move beyond where we are, move beyond the status quo, move beyond, you know, it's like uh, when uh, Narada Muni had come to Vyasadeva, and Vyasadeva was very, very disappointed in himself. He had written down all the scriptures, all the Itihasas, all the Puranas, all the Vedas, the Rig Veda, the Arya Veda, this Veda. And it's still, there was something in him that wasn't satisfied. And his guru appeared at the right time. When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And he said to him, oh, my dear Vyas, you have caused havoc. <laughs> In essence, because you've told the people that if they follow these scriptures and engage in furtive activities, material activities, it's okay because it's in the scriptures and the scriptures are bona fide. So you've given them the right to do furtive activities. So now how do you, how do you rectify that? How do you do that? And then Narada Muni said, please therefore describe the almighty Lord's activities for this alone will satisfy the hankerings of great learned men and at the same time mitigate the miseries of the masses of common people. So that personal aspect of God, that Bhagavan aspect, only that can fulfill the, uh, the desire, the deep longing within us to make some kind of connection with life, with love. So we try all the different aspects of sacrifices, all the different aspects of penance. But if we don't do it to please the Supreme Lord, we won't be satisfied. And I was thinking about, you know, I'm in Vrindavan, and I've come to Vrindavan because Vrindavan is the place of my mother, Srimati Radharani. And I remember I'm the mother of 10 children, five sons and five daughters. And I had my first child, and when I was going through the pain, I didn't call my father, I didn't call my husband, I called my mother. And now, right now, there's a time in my life when I'm calling my mother. And she has invited me to come to Vrindavan. And I am in Vrindavan by the grace of Srimati Radharani, and Srila Prabhupada. And in many ways, I was thinking about this word sacrifice and penance and charity. You know, and I'm thinking, I'm coming to Vrindavan. I will get everything from being in Vrindavan. I will get everything. Vrindavan is a place of all benediction. But then I had to think, and today I was really praying to Prabhupada. I said, what can I offer to Vrindavan? What can I give? And so I began to really, really think about that. You know, all the scriptures tell us just to be in Vrindavan. You get so much mercy, so many blessings, so much good thing. And I had to say, that's right. I'm, I'm getting benedicted. Whatever happened, if I live or die, coming to Vrindavan, getting the mercy of Srimati Radharani, I am getting benedicted. So my question was, what sacrifice am I prepared? Because I was thinking, whenever I read the scriptures, I try to apply it very presently to my life. You know, we're talking about sacrifice, and we're talking about charity, and we're talking about penance. And I try to understand what is Prabhupada asking for me to give. And so I began to think about this idea of being in Vrindavan and giving. And I, I asked Srimati Radharani to let me look at Vrindavan through the eyes of love. Don't let me see the sewers and the monkeys running around acting crazy and the lizards. And let me see the Vrindavan where everybody loves everybody. The trees are wish fulfilling trees. And Radharani and Krishna are very satisfied to be here. And it is actually possible to have that vision in spite of the superficial appearances. But to have that vision, I have to be willing to give something to Vrindavan. 
I have to be willing to give something to Srimati Radharani. I have to be willing to make sacrifices and give charity and not just be here because I need my mother. And so in doing that, it's making me look at the devotees and everybody I see in a different light because these are all inhabitants of Vrindavan. And how I treat each and every one of these inhabitants is actually how I'm treating my mother. Whether it's the monkeys, whether it's the devotees who come from around the world, whether it's the citizens of Vrindavan. So that's my prayer to Srimati Radharani and to Srila Prabhupada to help me to respect each and every living entity as though they are in Vrindavan, which is that very special place where only people come by the mercy of Srimati Radharani. So that's the sacrifice that I'm asking to do and the charity. How do I give in charity? And also the chanting here, you know, because of my situation and the grace of Prabhupada is making me chant a lot better, a lot more attentively, a lot more crying out to the Lord. And you know, chanting is the sacrifice for this age. In our scriptures it said that anyone with sufficient intelligence will Im involve themselves in the Sankirtan movement. So, I, I was diagnosed with cancer in 2018, and it was a blow because I lived healthy. I mean, I've been a vegetarian for 40-something years. I, you know, I only ate prasada, my, you know. And it was a wake-up call in many ways, and, um, you know, I was asked to do chemotherapy, and I refused, and I was asked to do this other thing. And I, I had planned to come to Vrindavan and to Mayapur, and my doctor said, don't go, do a surgery first. And I said, no, I have to go first. And then, if Krishna allows, we'll do a surgery. So I came to Vrindavan, and by the grace of Srimati Radharani and Srila Prabhupada, I was able to make kind of a whirlwind tour of all the holy places, and go to Varsana and Radhakunda. And I, I was able to just pray to Srimati Radharani and just ask her, to allow me to surrender to whatever was her will. You know, we all have our ideas about life and death and how long we want to live and who we want to be connected with. But I asked the Lord to allow me to surrender to whatever was his will. And so then I went back home, I had the surgery, and for a while everything seemed like it would be okay. But then, a few months ago, they said it was bad in so many different places. So again, they recommended chemotherapy, and again, I said no, and again, I approached the Lord, what would you have me to do? And of course, my children and family, we were all somewhat devastated. But, you know, we, we've come to this Krishna consciousness movement to actually understand that Krishna is doing everything. And that if we are his servants, he is orchestrating our lives. So whether it's an illness or a non-illness or, you know, whatever it is, to understand that somehow or other this is the mercy of Krishna. So that was part of my austerity, is accepting this illness as Krishna's mercy. And then uh, one of my God sisters called and said, Krishna Nandini, you should go to Vrindavan. You should go to Vrindavan, you should try this treatment, and you should... And I had been feeling this pull from the mother spirit, the mother, Radha Rani. I'd been feeling that, and I said, okay, it just resonated. So here I sit before you, trying to understand what is actually sacrifice, and what is actually austerity, and what is actually penance that pleases God. Trying to be that, that person that my spiritual master, when he initiated me, wanted me to be trying to be that surrendered soul, trying to understand the real sacrifice is to give my life back to God and to trust him fully for everything. And the real penance is to do what is required, to do what I've been asked to do, to chant at least 16 rounds a day, to serve the devotees. That's the penance. And then the charity is to give whatever I can give my life in the service of my spiritual master because he gave his life for us. I was reading the other day, Prabhupada was writing in his journal in 1966 in New York and he was very much alone and he said today is the Adivas day of, I forget what particular festival it was, 
And he said, here I am, all alone. I have no devotee association. But still, I have come here to carry out my spiritual master's instructions. And Prabhupada said, so for me, any kind of personal inconvenience, it doesn't matter. I'm just here. So Prabhupada made that ultimate sacrifice for us. He could have stayed in Vrindavan. He could have been here with all the, the wonderful devotees here. This was Prabhupada's heart. But he made that sacrifice to come to the Western world, to call people like me out of illusion, call people from all over the world. So I just say that whenever we read the Bhagavad Gita, whenever we read the Bhagavatam, we should figure out how do we personalize that? What is Krishna? He didn't just speak to Arjuna. Krishna is speaking to us. We are the Arjunas of the day. So how do we engage in transcendental sacrifice, transcendental penance, transcendental charity? And that is the, 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 the question on the table for us today. Um, we, we understand that <coughs> There is, we spoke about there's non-scriptural uh, uh, faith, and then there's scriptural faith. And scriptural faith is, can be in three modes. In ignorance, people worship the ghosts and the hobgoblins, and in passion, they wor worship other human beings and that kind of thing. And in goodness, they worship the demigods, but it's all for some benefit. But we are to, transcendental faith means we worship Krishna without any expectation or without any demand of benefit. But it's automatic when you worship Krishna that you're going to have benefit. It's, a, it's just, that's the way love is. Krishna is love personified. He reciprocates. But it's about trust. I can't dictate to Krishna how he's going to give me his mercy. His mercy may come in the form of illness. His mercy may come in the form of taking everything I have. But if I really appreciate that Krishna is my best friend, Suridam Sarva Bhutanam, Am I ever well wisher? Then I'll trust him. Like that. So part of this mode of goodness, going beyond, for us the Om Tat Sat manifests mostly in the Hare Krishna mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And as we chant Hare Krishna with more and more faith and with more and more surrender and more and more honesty, then our hearts become pure and we are gradually elevated to another level of devotional service and that's the whole point of krishna consciousness to Prabhupada says our krishna is a great family man and we have to prepare how to be a part of krishna's family in krishna's family everybody looks out for one another they take care of one another they respect one another even the monkey even the ant is treated with respect and care so we are practicing we're practicing how to be a part of Krishna's family. And our practice comes from chanting Hare Krishna, from reading the Bhagavad Gita, from crying out for the mercy of Chaitanya Nityananda. You know, I've been in this world forever, so many lifetimes. I've forgotten you. I've done this cycle, Janma, Mrityu, Jaraviyadi, over and over again. I'm tired, Lord. I really, really want to trust you. I really, really want to make that ultimate sacrifice and come back home, back to Godhead. And that consciousness we can have right now. We, we don't have to wait until we leave. And that is the, that is the promise of Krishna consciousness. And that's why uh, Lord Chaitanya, when he inaugurated the Sankirtan movement, he made it very, very simple. And he gave us ultimately three main factors. Namaruji, develop a taste for the holy name. Vaishnava Seva, serve the devotees. You know, sometimes we'll serve devotees if they're very, if they're sannyasis or if they're, you know, very powerful and they got money or this or that, but no. Lord Chaitanya said, serve devotees. Any, any devotee, any person who has taken up this path of Krishna consciousness is very dear to the Lord. And we should serve them without discrimination. Prabhupada did it. He didn't make discrimination if people had money or didn't have money or if they were so-called knowledgeable or if they weren't. So, Namaruji, Vaishnava Seva, and Jiva Doyo. To have compassion 
on the fallen souls who are suffering like anything in this world. And that's why our beloved Srila Prabhupada did what he did. He left Vrindavan. He left the land of love. He left Radharani's place because Jiva Doya, to have compassion, to share with others the message that you don't have to suffer in this world. Someone loves you. There is hope. And I am here to show you that. And Prabhupada so much exemplified what is actual sacrifice, what is actual penance, what is actual charity, and everything he said and did. And so if we just try to, even a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, follow in the footsteps of Srila Prabhupada, then Sri Mati Radharani, Srila Prabhupada, they will reciprocate with us. And they will give us a kind of joy they will give us a kind of peace. They will give us an empowerment. Because being a devotee is not just a word. Being a devotee is empowerment. When people see devotees, they're supposed to have some feeling that something's different, that there's a light in the world a little more. There's a little more love in the world. There's a little more caring in the world. And this is how, when Lord Chaitanya said, that there would be a 10,000 year golden age. It wasn't because it'll be magic. It was because we, his followers, would take this movement so seriously that we would become lights in this age and we would attract others to become light and we would attract others to become light. And then gradually, gradually, the world would be a better place. One pure devotee, one, who has faith in God, one can change the whole world. And we saw that with Prabhupada. We see that. He's changing the whole world. So, like I said, whenever I read the scriptures, I start doing inventory. I start saying, okay, Krishna Nandini, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, how are you practicing? <laughs> what, 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 how are you um, responding to the instruction that Lord Krishna has given Arjuna? And I, I fall short, but then I ask for mercy, and then I chant more, and then I study more, and then I serve more, and, and then I feel more hope. So, Om Tat Sat. This Tat refers to Brahman sometimes, and when, whenever you, we ever do uh, sacrifices, and you'll hear the devotees, the priests, they'll say Om Tat Sat because this is a sacred uttering, a sacred mantra, and it brings a, a, a sacred vibe or more auspiciousness to the, to the vibe. And when I was trying to do a little research on the topic, um, I ran across this very interesting verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 10, that I'd like to share with you. Sadhyavratam sadhyaparam tri sayam Sadhyasya yonim nihitam cha sadye Sadhyasya sadhyamrita sadhya necham Sadhyamakam tvam saranam prapanayi Canto 10, Chapter 2, Text 26 The demigods prayed, O Lord, you never deviate from your vow, which is always perfect because whatever you decide is perfectly correct and cannot be stopped by anyone. I like that. Being present, and I like that because it, it refers to Lord Chaitanya said, my name shall go in every town and village. And here it says, whatever you decide cannot be stopped by anyone. So the Lord's mission will go on because it cannot be stopped by anyone. And it says, being present in the three phases of cosmic manifestation creation, maintenance, and annihilation, you are the supreme truth. Indeed, unless one is completely truthful, one cannot achieve your favor, which therefore cannot be achieved by hypocrites. Wow, pretty deep. Can't be hypocritical and get the favor of God. And God knows everybody's heart. We can fool the, the they used to have a saying that you can fool the nurse, you can fool the other patients, but you can't fool the doctor. <laughs> So here, the doctors, Lord Chaitanya, we can't fool them. We can't be a hypocrite. He says, the demigods continued, you are the active principle, the real truth, and all the ingredients of creation, and therefore you are known as Antayami, the inner force. You are equal to everyone, 
and your instructions apply for everyone for all time. You are the beginning of all truth. Therefore, offering our obeisances, we surrender unto you. Kindly give us protection. So I was looking up also, one devotee said the word sat can be used as an acronym for supreme absolute truth. I like that. Like when you say sat, supreme absolute truth. And we understand that this phrase, Om Tat Sat, is a method of moving us from one level of faith to another. And in our case, as Vaishnavas, the Mahari Krishna mantra is our Om Tat Sat. Um, I guess I can stop here <laughs> and ask, are there any questions or comments? Hare Krishna Prabhu. Yes, please. Uh -huh. I guess so. Thank you, Prabhu. Hi, bro. Uh, so you mentioned that, uh, which made me really nervous. You said that you got to the point where uh, your chanting was more honest. Yes. You more honestly in yes. So I was just wondering uh, what the tipping point is from from uh, being dishonest to being honest, or is it one of those dynamics where uh, the more honest you become, the more dishonest you feel? Ah, uh -huh, very good question. I like that. I like how you phrased that. <coughs> so, you know, uh, this whole process, Chaita Darpana Marjan, I'm cleansing the, the mirror of the heart. It's a very interesting process because just when we think, okay, you know what? I'm pretty good. I chant every day. I go to the Mangala Arati. I offer all my food to Krishna. I'm, I'm you know... All of a sudden, in your heart, boom, some little jealous thought, some little devious thing, some past anarta is there. And you say, oh, my God. So the idea is, chanada peace in each other. You know, Lord, except for your mercy, I'm, what am I? Nothing. You know, and so for me, I think it's just coming to the point where the urgency is there. You know, and Krishna helped you. And, you know, Prabhupada was such a good, pure example. And he has so much love for us that in spite of all of our shortcomings, in spite of all of our lack of qualification, I wrote an article recently for the Back to Godhead magazine called Battlefield Commissions. And it talked about how Prabhupada gave his early disciples, gave us battlefield commission. We weren't qualified. <laughs> what did we know about doing anything? But he said, you do this, and you do this, and you do this, and you do this. Go publish a book. Go to China and build a temple. Da, 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 da. And he knew that everybody wasn't going to make it. That's battle, you know, on the word. And I gave an example, like even when Krishna gave Arjuna instructions on the battlefield, all of those warriors were qualified. They had, they were Mahatrati and this Rati and that Rati. But when Prabhupada came, none of us were qualified. But yet, because we accepted, right, Narayani? We accepted. It's, it, no qualification. We just said, okay, Prabhupada. So over time, that acceptance, you just stay there. It makes you more honest because you, 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 you don't want to cheat. You can't cheat your way back to Godhead, you know. And I sometimes ask devotees, why are you doing this? Why are you chanting? Why are you getting initiated? What's your point? You playing games? Or you, be, or you actually want to love God with all your heart. You actually want to be in your original constitutional position. Then you got to be honest. You know, you got to say, Lord Chaitanya. I am so unfit. I am just so unqualified. But without your mercy, what am I? You just got to say that. All right, Chris. All right, Chris. Can you pass him now? Thank you very much for your class I have two questions. Yes. They're connected only. First question is many times. In front of deities, I, I become complacent. I'm not grateful and I'm not eager 
It's like, okay, I'm taking Desh, Desh, Darshan. Uh, so how to overcome that complacency? This is my first question. Okay. My second question is that uh, how to test ourselves, whether I'm uh, making progress in devotion service. Okay. I think I'm going to answer your second question first. Um, Prabhupada said that uh, we can understand that we're making progress because we can feel when we're not jealous, when we're not envious, when we're actually happy to see another person be successful and do well. You can know that you're making spirit. I'm actually happy. You know, I was reading the story of uh, Yamuna Devi, bless her heart, one of the pure servants of Prabhupada. And uh, Giri Rod Swami was explaining how she just, whatever Prabhupada wanted, she just served and served. And one day, uh, someone came in, and I think it was true to Kirti, and he said, Prabhupada wants me, to, wants me to cook for him. And Yamuna had always been cooking for Prabhupada. And so she said, okay, well, when do I start? Because she thought he meant he wanted her to cook. But he said, no, Yamuna, he asked me to cook. She said, well, how can I help you? Not a tinge of oh, I'm disappointed, or I'm sick. No, let me serve you. Let me help my God brother serve his. So when you don't feel those envious things, when you feel <laughs> actually that you are really less qualified than you were a year ago, all of these are signs <laughs> that you're doing, you're making spiritual progress. <laughs> yes. And then the other question is, a lot of our spiritual progress comes from service and serving the devotees. Like I said, without discrimination, serving, 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 dasa, dasa, anudas. Serving devotees who are very cheerful in Krishna consciousness. Serving devotees who are inspired and inspiring will help you because, you know, this is kind of contagious. You know, and we don't want to be complacent in devotional service. We do want to, and you can pray. Like a lot of times you can pray, Lord, I'm just seeing like I'm stuck in this rut. Will you kindly help me? Like that. Mm-hmm. All right, Chris. Yes, Mother. You were speaking about the pure devotee. Prabhupada is the only one pure devotee who has uh, given us uh, this uh, Krishna consciousness. So after Prabhupada, there are so many devotees, they are engaging just like you, me, everybody, we are meeting people and we are asking them to chant Hare Krishna and they are chanting. So purity of the pure devotee is continuing and we are getting so many opportunities and we see how we have expanded our self. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Did anyone else have a question? Oh, Prabhu, could you hand him? Hare Krishna. I was just curious to know uh, if, I did, if I did miss, what, what's the situation with your cancer? <laughs> Very observant. Um, so uh, the cancer is said to be in three places in my body, and I'm doing this treatment called the Hodo treatment, Ayurvedic treatment. Very intense. Very interesting. Um, but I, I, I think that Srimati Radharani had a purpose in me coming here for this apparent illness, but something much deeper, something much greater. But thank you, Prabhu. Any other <coughs> question, comment? Ladies, no questions? You all mean, okay. <laughs> Right. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you brought that out too because um, in that particular verse where Prabhupada does a purport to that, he says, sacrifice charity should never be given up, even by the great souls. And he speaks about the sacrifice of marriage in particular in that purport. You know, and, and, and marriage in our uh, uh, society is not doing as well as it should. 
And, you know, Prabhupada wanted us to have more healthy, loving, Krishna conscious marriages because when, when that happens, people are naturally more attracted. That's one. That's one reason why in America, the Jehovah Witness and Mormon religion, they're just growing like anything because there's a great emphasis on family. And I think that we have one of the most precious, we have the most precious loving philosophy. So why not demonstrate that in loving, healthy marriages? But it's because there's a misunderstanding about what marriage is and what love is and what attachment is and what detachment is. So we have to get a better, you know, situation. Prabhupada said it shouldn't be given up. And so we need to understand that. Thank you, Mata. Any other, uh, you had a comment, Mata, question? I wanted to tell us how you came to Christian consciousness. Oh, <laughs> that will take hours and hours and hours. <laughs> okay, make it short. So Mata Ji asked if I would share a little bit how I came to Krishna consciousness. Do you all want me to tell that story? <laughs> okay. <laughs> So when I was 17 years old, I went to the University of Chicago on a full scholarship. And that was really the first time I had been away from home or anything. And while I was gone, my mother became a Hare Krishna. And so, oh, okay, all right. And so she, fast forward a couple years, I had gotten married and I, um, was working at the Chicago Urban League. And my mother came to visit me and gave me a Bhagavad Gita. And when I read the Bhagavad Gita, I was 19 years old, and that Bhagavad Gita just resonated in my heart. You know, I like to read. I, I, my mother could chastise me by taking books from me. That's how much I love to read. And I would go to bed at night with a flashlight, reading books. But this Bhagavad Gita was on a whole different plane. And, and as I was reading it, it felt like it was being read inside of me. That was just such an unusual thing. And so when I finished, I knew Prabhupada was my guru, and I knew I had to be a Hare Krishna. Now bear in mind, I had never seen a Hare Krishna. The only person I saw was my mother, and she didn't try to explain it to me. She just gave me the book. It's probably wisdom. You know how sometimes young people think, well, if my mother is saying this is right, I should, you know. So anyway, um, my husband and I, we started chanting three rounds a day because that's what I thought you'd do. I didn't understand. I didn't know the devotees. And eventually I left. I was in Chicago and I came to join my mother. And we practiced Krishna consciousness for about six months. And there was a temple there, one of the very first. This is 1971, before a lot of you all were born, maybe. And. Um, there, this one temple president, he gave us a very difficult time. It was Krishna's arrangement, but it did not feel like that at the time. Whatever we tried to do in Krishna consciousness it just seems like he hindered it. And finally, we decided we would leave Cleveland and try to find a place where there were devotees. Now, I don't know how many of you have been to America, but Cleveland and Texas are like a day's ride apart, so 24 hours. Anyway, um, my mother, who was a very faithful person, just literally prayed for guidance. And my first husband came and he drove us, and we ended up in Dallas, Texas. It's a long story, but we didn't know anybody in Dallas, Texas, had never been there. And so there was a new temple there, and this is 1972 by this time. And so uh, we went to the temple, and I imagine we looked quite raggedy because it was my mother, me, my first husband, uh, my little girl, I had one daughter, she was two, and I was pregnant with a second child, and uh, my three brothers, 14, 12, and four brothers, 14, 12, and five or something. Anyway, we must have looked really <laughs> ragtag, 24-hour trip with children and not knowing where we're going, and we ended up in Dallas, Texas. And so we went to the temple, and uh, that we told the temple president that we had come to practice Krishna consciousness. Now you all have to understand, 1972, there were no emails and internet and cell phones and none of that. And there was no, there were very few devotees and even less black body devotees. And so here we are, ended up by Krishna's arrangement in Dallas, Texas. And we went to the temple president and 
And he said, excuse me, and he ran and he called the Cleveland Temple President. And the Cleveland Temple President said, oh, don't let them in, they're, they're troublemakers. And so my mother said, Prabhu, we're just two women and children, we have no place else to go, we're devotees, what to do? And he said, okay, okay, you all can stay here, but tomorrow you have to go because Prabhupada will be here. Prabhupada, that we didn't even know he was in the country. Prabhupada gonna be in Dallas, Texas. Come on, Lord. <laughs> that was all we needed, you know? And so the next day, Prabhupada came, and Prabhupada sent for my mother, because unbeknownst to everybody, my mother had written like Prabhupada letters in Cleveland, and he had answered them. And my mother was such an eager devotee, all glories to Bhumata Devi Dasi, that she gave all of her children Sanskrit names even before they, we were initiated. We were wearing tilak and everything. And that was one of the complaints at the temple. He said, you can't do all this and you're not initiated, right? And so Prabhupada sent for my mother, and she sat in his office for six hours. And then the next day, she saw his secretary at a water fountain, and he said, uh, Mataji, Prabhu? No, he called her Prabhu, because Prabhupada had us calling each other Prabhu, whether we were men or women. I remember that. <laughs> and so he um, said, Prabhu, Prabhupada is doing initiations tomorrow. And so my mother said, well, you know, we want to be initiated. And so he went and told Prabhupada, and Prabhupada sent back and said, ask her how many. And so <laughs> at the time, I'm leaving a lot out of the story. Y'all going to have to read my book when it comes out, but anyway. <laughs> At the time, Sasha Maharaj and some of the other devotees, they were saying, Prabhupada, don't initiate them because um, we don't know what their sadhana is. We don't, they're not affiliated with any temple, you know, like that. <laughs> and so Prabhupada initiated us. And he initiated my mother as Bhumata Devi Dasi. My stepdad had come. By that time when we found Prabhupada was there, he got on a bus, a Greyhound bus, and ran down there. And he got initiated, Ripchan Das. I was initiated, Krishna Nandini Devi Dasi, my two brothers who were 12 and 14, Asutosh and Subhanu. And then um, on the same day, Prabhupada installed the beautiful Radha Kalachandi deities. Who's seen Radha Kalachandi? Aren't they just the most gorgeous? Kalachandi is beautiful, round face. He's the oldest deity in America, 500 years old at least, from Jaipur. So a whole lot of specialness to that whole everything. You know, but you, you all have no idea of the suffering that we went through before we got to that point. <laughs> but it was okay, it was all okay. Because once we got with Prabhupada, it was okay. And so, um, years later, I saw that devotee that had caused us trouble. And I, he said, Prabhu, I'm so sorry. Would you please apologize to your mother and your family for me? Because if I could take it back, I would. And I said, Prabhu, I wouldn't let you take it back. I said, because of how you treated us, we ended up in Dallas, Texas, on Radhastami, getting initiated when Radha Kalachandi was installed. You can't take that back. <laughs> And so then he said, Krishna Nandini, do you know the rest of that story? And I said, yeah, because, you know, somebody had told me that the devotees were saying, don't initiate them, blah, blah, blah. And he said, no. He said, Sasra Maharaj told me that people were saying, don't, don't initiate you and your family. And he said that Prabhupada said, whenever I see a spark, of Krishna consciousness, I must fan it. And he said, Krishna Dini, just think if Prabhupada hadn't fanned that spark. Just think. You know, now here you are, 40 some years later, you're a devotee, your mother's a devotee, your children are devotee. Just think. I don't even want to think about that. But Prabhupada fanned that spark. And that's our service. We got a fan sparks too. We're supposed to, when we see a little teeny Krishna consciousness just trying to be there, we're supposed to fan that. And that's how I sit before you today, almost 50 years later. So that's my story <laughs> summarized. <laughs> All right, well, 
Aiva, thank you all very much. Srila Prabhupada Kija, Vaishnava Sangha Kija.